Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be presenting to the ShareSoc audience uh, for, I think, the fifth time. Uh, we first presented, I think, back in 2015, ahead of our main market listing. Uh, and as Mark said, uh, the returns have been very strong since then. Uh, as a brief introduction to HVP before we get into the presentation, we are a listed private equity fund of funds. We're in the FTSE 250. Uh, we're the largest listed fund of funds in the sector. And currently we have NAV or net assets of $2.9 billion. So we have the scale and liquidity to provide a useful private equity solution for all types of investor in the public market. Charlotte, over to you for a brief intro. Hi there, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Charlotte Edgar. I head up the investor relations for HVPE. Um, one of our key areas is making sure that we communicate well to uh, our retail audience. Um, and we are constantly trying to fine tune our messaging to make sure that we're telling a, a clear story. So hopefully we can tell you the story of HVPE in the following slides. And, uh, and hopefully convince the 40% the non-holders that this might be a potential option for investment. So thank you, Amanda. I think we can see the slides now. If we go to the first one. So what is HVPE fundamentally? Really, it's a, it's a listed wrapper around a portfolio of high quality private companies around the world. We have effectively a thousand material individual company exposures spread across all types of private market strategy. We here show at the top of the slide several key phrases that really encapsulate the offering that HVP represents. We're here really to provide easy access to a diversified global portfolio, importantly, of high quality private companies. And we do this by investing through our manager, Harbourvest Partners, into a range of private equity funds. In doing so, we're helping to support innovation and growth in the global economy, uh, of course, delivering value uh, for all our stakeholders. In the last five years, we've increased NAV per share organically by 115%, and the share price in sterling has risen by 118%. If we look back over a longer period though, uh, if you look at a 10 year view, for example, an investor who'd purchased 10,000 pounds worth of shares 10 years ago would today have a holding of 48,000 pounds. On the right hand side, we provide some of the key words that we think really sum up HVP as a company. The portfolio is highly distinctive. It is not possible to replicate the portfolio uh, any other way than purchasing HVP shares. We're investing effectively alongside institutional investors into a market that is rather opaque for many uh, individual investors. So I think the individual investor is looking for an experienced specialized manager and Harbourvest has a 40 year track record uh, of investing only in private markets. Uh, we manage the portfolio prudently and we also manage the balance sheet carefully uh, to ensure that the vehicle is robust and able to, to meet its obligations. We provide access to pre-IPO venture opportunities much earlier than many other uh, peers in the market. We invest through some of the top performing venture capital managers alongside buyout managers as well, and also through the real asset space. So the portfolio represents really a one-stop shop for investors who are looking for private markets exposure on a global basis, whilst attempting to, to mitigate uh, the potential risks in investing in private companies. So the performance um, summary at the bottom, uh, I should draw out that we have a, a benchmark index, the FTSE All World Total Return, which is effectively the closest public market index in terms of geographical weighting to, to HVP's portfolio. And since inception in 2007, uh, which was the year of HVP's IPO, we've outperformed the FTSE All World by 3.4 percentage points annually over that time. And to translate that into the terms that I started with, 
the £10,000 investment in 2011 would have grown to £48,000 in HVPE, but only £29,000 in the FTSE All World. So moving to the next slide. So our proposition can be rather complex, but here we provide the essence effectively of, of what we're offering. Uh, we're providing a gateway to opportunities globally that, as I mentioned, are, are difficult to access, if not impossible for the majority of individual investors. Harbourvest has a long track record, is very experienced and has more than $76 billion under management, primarily for institutional clients. So in buying shares in HVPE, you're investing alongside endowment funds, pension funds, and sovereign wealth funds uh, in the main. The diagram on the slide shows a simplified structure with HVPE, Harbourvest Global Private Equity, shown at the top in the middle. And of course, as an investment company, we have our own board of directors who oversee the balance sheet and the investment returns and apply pressure on Harbourvest to perform. We have, of course, shareholders who are all uh, on a, an equal footing with a sole class of share, full voting rights, uh, and so every shareholder uh, ranks equally uh, in the structure. HVPE invests through the Harbourvest funds, indicated in the middle at the uh, bottom of the diagram, into uh, both underlying managed funds and directly into private companies. So the portfolio is constructed in such a way as to minimize volatility, uh, it's very diverse, and we tend to see very consistent annual returns as a result. So moving to the next slide. So private equity is a term that's somewhat uh, misunderstood, I think, and, and potentially uh, carries connotations that are not always positive, especially in the UK. But essentially, it simply means investing in unlisted companies uh, into the equity of those companies. And so really we're similar to many other newer funds that are providing exposure to unlisted companies. The current global market size of private equity is, is $3.9 trillion, which may seem very large and it, and it is a large market, but when set against the $70 trillion in the global public equity markets, it does somewhat uh, put that into perspective. And given the addressable market may not be dissimilar there is plenty of room for growth in, in the industry. On the left of the bottom, we show you the, the penetration of private equity AUM effectively as a percentage of GDP across the three regions shown on the chart. So for example, in the US, private equity AUM represents only uh, equivalent to 9% of GDP, whereas the public markets are almost one and a half times GDP. In Europe, the ratio is somewhat higher in favour of private markets, but still, uh, they're still dwarfed by the public market uh, AUM. Asia has somewhat lower penetration, though, 4% uh, versus 98% for the public markets. And that's a region where Harbourvest is, is growing actively. So in the last 20 years, the global private equity industry has grown, uh, grown AUM effectively by nine times. Uh, through a combination of value growth and also, of course, raising additional funds. In that time, the public market equity value has increased by only three times, and we've seen a 40% reduction in the number of public companies in the US and a similar reduction in Europe. So there's very much been a shift from public to private, and many of the growth opportunities available today are only accessible via private markets funds. Next slide, please. Now, I want to provide an insight into one part of our portfolio, which is the, the venture side. And I think is, uh, at the moment at least, very much in vogue. Uh, we've seen many IPOs of high profile venture backed companies in, in recent months. And HVP has been a participant in some of those IPOs on the sell side, as some of our companies have matured and, and moved to the public market. On this slide, we're showing uh, logos for 50 of the largest global so-called unicorn companies. And those are privately backed companies with a valuation of more than a billion dollars. In total, there are more than 650 unicorns. Uh, so we're showing only the largest 50 of those. And of this 50, HVP has exposure to 34 in its portfolio right now. 
I don't want to overstate this because we are very well diversified and some of these exposures are relatively small. But I wanted to pull out a couple of examples to, to show you exactly what we're doing and what we're offering in HVP's portfolio. So on the left hand side, you'll see a, a logo for Klarna, which is currently our largest single individual company exposure, just under 2% of NAV. That business started in 2005 in Sweden. It's an online payment uh, facilitator and, and effectively uh, online lender through a buy now, pay later approach. So what Klarna does is it partners with e-commerce platforms to offer uh, interest-free credit or, or even uh, charged credit to consumers who want to spread out the payments uh, for a particular item. And that business has grown incredibly rapidly. It's very, very large today. It's one of the largest unicorns globally. Uh, HVPE, through a direct co-investment fund several years ago, uh, is, is clearly an investor in Klarna and has benefited from the very rapid growth in the valuation of that business. There is press speculation around an IPO, so we may see uh, further distributions coming through from that investment. That was a relatively late stage investment for us. And, and another that perhaps provides a slightly different example is the payments, also a payments business, Stripe, which is based in the US, but founded by two brothers from Ireland who moved to university in the US. And they founded the firm just over 10 years ago. At that point, they raised seed capital. So in 2011, they raised capital from well-known uh, venture capital backers and private individuals such as Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, but they also at the same time raised capital from a manager called Andreessen Horowitz, uh, which was founded in fact by two of the entrepreneurs uh, from the early days of the internet. HVP through Harbourvest has exposure to Andreessen Horowitz funds, so we're providing the type of very early stage exposures to promising opportunities that only those managers uh, can provide. Since 2011, the valuation of Stripe has moved from $20 million to $95 billion. So nearly a 5,000 times return in terms of the, the enterprise value of that business. Now, clearly that is an unusual and extreme example, but it nonetheless illustrates that HVPE offers access to opportunities that simply are not available through other listed funds. Moving to the next slide. And I think it's important to pause and, and ask why a listed structure works for a private equity portfolio, and why an investor should consider this route. And frankly, there are several advantages. There are one or two disadvantages, which I'll pull out, but there are many advantages. Firstly, it's extremely easy to access given the minimum investment size is the cost of a single share, in our case, around 21 pounds. We have daily pricing and liquidity we offer a fully managed program. So we're not simply a static portfolio. The portfolio is continually evolving as mature funds sell down assets, the cash comes back into HVPE and we reinvest that into newer funds and new opportunities. We have a very diversified portfolio established over a large number of vintage years. So the jargon in private equity is very similar to the jargon in the wine industry. We refer to a vintage as the year in which investments were laid down or made. So we have a portfolio that's very well spread over vintages going back 15 years. And that helps to de-risk exposure to any given vintage year period. And as I've mentioned, we have an independent board of directors whose role it is to oversee the fund to ensure that it's managed in a prudent way and that the investments are performing. The disadvantages, which I have not included on the slide, but will mention, are that there is perhaps more volatility through a listed route, of course, than going through a private uh, commitment, because the discount at which the shares trade versus the net asset value can vary with sentiment in the public markets, as we've seen indeed in the last 12 months. But similarly, that can provide an opportunity to buy at favourable valuations. On the right-hand side of the slide, just some essential statistics on HVPE, and I mentioned the net asset value, but the market capitalization in sterling is also, of course, large. We have $1.6 billion market cap. We've grown at double digit rates over 10 years, referring back to my earlier figures. And we see typically more than a million pounds worth of shares traded in a given day. 
and that allows most of our investors to uh, manage their positions very easily without the need to negotiate trades with brokers. Uh, the underlying manager is well resourced. We have uh, 50 managing directors in the firm uh, amongst more than 700 employees and the average tenure of those managing directors who are responsible for the investments is 12 years. Many have been with us for more than 20 years, however. And the current discount to NAV to bring everybody up to date is actually 21%. It's moved a little bit since the slide was put together, but still relatively wide by recent standards. Prior to COVID, we were trading at around 10 to 12%. So next slide. And now I'll move on to Charlotte uh, for her section on effectively the five reasons to buy HVPE, and she'll take you through each one of these in turn. Thank you, Richard. So what we've tried to do here is to distill five reasons why you might consider buying HVPE. We think there are many more, um, but we do think these are, are the key reasons. And I'll aim to go through each of these um, headlines in more detail. So I'll, I'll just sort of um, go over the highlights here. So as Richard has already pointed out, we've had a strong track record. You know, we do have a very diversified portfolio, but it has delivered strong and steady returns. Our second point is expert selection. And I would actually take these in, in two, sort of two areas, you know, one experts and two selection. You know, we have experts across the globe in the key private equity markets. And the other point is selection. So even though we are hugely diversified, when you look at our investments, we're actually only investing in around five to 7% of the market. So actually we are quite selective. We're diversified um, and we think it is our, the, the diversification, which has actually been very um, conducive to the, to the strong returns. We do find that different regions, different strategies perform well at different times. And we think this has held us in good stead and seen us through the COVID crisis um, in a very well. Thoughtful and prudent management. Now, I always say that the, the balance sheet is a slightly boring part, but the actual, it's you know a, a very critical part of managing HVPE. And when you have um, multiple cash flows and you're committing to a number of private equity funds, managing the balance sheet to ensure you can um, honor your liabilities is absolutely um, um, critical. And trusted people. So there are three layers of, of, of people we think associated with, with HVPE. The board, fully dedicated, um, fully dedicated core team, and also, Underneath that is Harvest Global Platform, where you have access to over 150 investment professionals. Next slide, please. Back one, thank you. So just a little bit on track record. Like I said, I'm going to delve into each of these, these points to, to give a little bit, a little bit more context and, uh, and evidence to, to each of these points. So on the left-hand side, we show the, the now per share total return in sterling. As you can see, HVPE is in the navy blue here, and we've outperformed over five and 10 years, um, outperformed our, our nearest peer group. I think it's, it's key to point out the, the long-term retu returns over 10 years, which is more stark versus the, the five years. And we really do see this as a long-term buy and hold proposition. So whilst obviously you can trade in the shares daily, um, you know the underlying assets are in themselves long term. Uh, a typical private equity fund is around 10, 10 years long, and therefore we do feel that people would be minded to uh, adopt a sort of longer term approach to investing in HVPE. And if you look on the right hand side, we share here our five year annual performance. Now. Richard pointed out the compound annual growth rate over 10 years of 13.2%. If you look at that over five years, that's over 16% annualized. And so we think again, you know, this is really strong, steady performance. 
And Rich has already flagged the discount at which the shares trade. The gray line on the, the right hand chart is the discount. And we have um, since COVID widened out and remained stubbornly wide um, despite reporting our largest NAV per share. And this remains a, you know, a huge frustration for us, the sector generally, um, and we're doing all we can to try and promote the vehicle to you know, uh, convey a clear message to, to hope, so hope people can understand what this, this vehicle is and you know, the, the performance speaks for itself. Next slide, please. So expert selection. So this year, I'm sorry, this month, we announced that we have opened a new office in Singapore. So that takes us to 11 offices worldwide. Now, as mentioned, we're fully entrenched in the key private equity market. We've been in Asia for a very long time. Um, it's, we've been investing in Asia since the, the, the 1980s, but opened our Hong Kong office in, in 1996. We've got experts on the ground, which is absolutely key when you are making investments in these regions. And there's a huge amount of knowledge sharing across the firm. Um, and we have uh, experts in the primary, secondary and direct um, in, in each of these key regions. And I think the, the opening of the office in Singapore probably speaks to um, Harbour Best's view on Asia and our own view ourselves. And I'll come to that when we come to diversification. Um, as, we're, as we're quite bullish on the region, which has been a strong performer for us in recent years. But I think what we're trying to show here is, you know, Harborvest has been around for over 35 years. We've been doing this for a long time. Private equity and private markets are our bread and butter. So you're really getting the experience and the expertise. And like I said, you know, um, you know we are hugely di diversified. But we, there is a huge private equity market out there, and we're distilling that into, you know, the holdings for HPPE, and 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 actually, you know, the, the portfolio is, is is quite selective. And as I, as I said, we've, the firm has been growing. It's now seventy six billion of assets under management, and the teams and employees are growing. And we now have over one hundred and fifty uh, investment professionals across the world. Next slide, please. So diversified exposure, we do think this is a key benefit of HVPE. It is probably the thing that helps manage risk in the portfolio. So whilst we have exposure to those exciting companies that Richard highlighted earlier, and as you can see on the right hand side, we do have an overweight to technology by nature of our, our exposure to, to venture. But this is offset by investments in more mature businesses who incidentally, are benefiting from the you know, technology trend and the disruption in the market because more mature businesses have to stay, keep up with the Joneses and make sure that they're staying, remaining comp competitive. Looking on the left-hand side, our, our largest companies, again, I think it, this, this speaks to the global exposure that you are getting as an investor in, in, in HVPE. Um, you can see here the, the, the top 10, which represents about 10% of, of NAV, um, you know, our, our European, uh, US, and, 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 and cover Asia as well. And I think this really speaks to the diversification that you're getting um, with, with HVPE. One of the things we do do is we invest into primary funds uh, a little bit more than secondary and direct. And these are funder funds. So essentially, that means that investments are going into multiple vintage years that, that Richard highlighted before. And we think this is a good way to get good vintage year exposure over the coming, coming years. And again, you know, through this structure, you are getting a multi-manager approach. So you are, um, you know, the, the investment here is in the professionals that are, are doing the most active form of investment into private markets. Next slide, please. So thoughtful management, this looks a bit of a busy slide, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize this because this is basically our business model. And the way HEP is structured means that we make commitments to Harbour Vest funds. They invest, 
They return the capital to us when they exit investments, and then we reinvest again. Now, HVPE has grown organically. We haven't raised any new capital. So essentially, we have just recycled the distributions to make more commitments to harbour vest funds. And we've done this because of the, you know, the strong, strong performance. And just to be absolutely clear, this is a growth vehicle. So we do um, reinvest all the capital that we've received back from, from the investment. So no dividend is paid. And the final point just uh, along the bottom is our access to funding. As I mentioned, you know, having a strong balance sheet is absolutely critical for a closed ended vehicle investing into multiple private equity funds. So we need to make sure that we have enough capital resource that will enable us to invest in the best opportunities um, in, in the market. And it's very carefully managed and we make sure that we have, we've got a five year evergreen credit facility, which we did draw down on during COVID when there's a little bit of uncertainty and at the time some distribution dried up. But I think ourselves and the listed private equity market has massively improved their, their balance sheets to make sure that they can see through periods such as COVID. Um, and, and we feel that we, you know, we are prudently managed and, and in a really strong position so that we can keep growing the vehicle and making these investments. And so the people, if any of you joined last time, you might spot that we have one new face in the top row of the board, Libby Byrne. She joined us in March this year. Pleased to say that increases female diversity on, on the board. Andrew Moore, who's been on the board since inception, will be stepping down at the AGM. Libby brings with her experience from Ernst & Young, uh, so auditor by background. And uh, alongside that, she is young, bright and full of ideas. And we're really excited to, to have her join the board. We have a dedicated core team myself and Richard, as you see, see here on the, the, the call today. Um, and we're, we're expanding out um, and so that we have full resource. And this team that you see here are fully dedicated to HVPE. Um, anyone else who also who was not familiar with HVP, we, we, we appointed a head of corporate governance last May to make sure that the, the vehicle is even, um, the governance uh, best practices is, 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 is upheld. And I've talked about the investment manager. Um, we have had we have got plenty of experience within the investment manager and I think you know what we're offering here is you know a, a sort of fully comprehensive um, team that is making quality um, investments into private markets. Next slide and with that I will pass back to Richard who will do a final wrap-up. Many thanks, Charlotte. Um, so hopefully we've given some uh, tasters as to, as to why HVP may be of interest. And of course, um, there's very much more behind, um, very much more detail behind this uh, that we're happy to provide. And, and I believe we have a QA and a session coming up as well. But just to sum up, uh, I, I want to finish by stressing that HVP provides access to a, a very diversified portfolio that's very difficult uh, for any other investor to replicate. So we're providing something you know, really, really uh, unique. Uh, we've delivered very strong returns. We do believe that we do our best to manage risk in the portfolio, uh, not only through the investment selection and management thereof, but also the management of the balance sheet uh, with, uh, with prudence in mind. Uh, we are easily available on all the usual platforms, as I'm sure you'll be aware. So all the execution only uh, online platforms will, will have HVPE uh, as a, a stock available to buy. Uh, all the details are there in terms of tickers. We have a sterling quote and a US dollar quote for those who pre prefer to go the US dollar route. And of course, we're eligible as a FTSE 250 company for ISAs and SIPs uh, and so on. And I want to finish that with you know, a simple message that you know, we're, we're always here. We're, we're very much dedicated to investor relations and to maintaining contact with all our shareholders. So, so we very much welcome uh, inquiries from, from individuals as well. Uh, we also run our own events. Uh, last week, we held a, a webinar for our annual results, which is more detailed, of course, than, than this presentation uh, can be, given the time constraint. Uh, so I'd, I'd very much welcome any 
any viewer who would like to attend our next event, which will be the semi-annual results uh, later in the year. And with that, uh, I will hand back to Mark, I believe, for the questions. Thanks very much, uh, Richard and uh, Charlotte, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, so now we'll move on to the, the questions. There are, there are a fair number that have been raised. So the first question is, does the huge number of holdings you have mean that you are over diversified and the same level could be achieved at a lower cost? Uh, we, we certainly don't believe we're over diversified. It, it is something that I guess, um, you know, we, we, we have this comment um, occasionally. We represent around 5% of the available market. So Harbourvest is selecting from a very wide and kind of, you know, very deep pool of potential opportunities and selecting typically 5% of those. So we could go into more detail about that in terms of the investment approach, but uh, we, we invest across uh, primary, secondary and direct co-investment funds. All of them have their own kind of unique features and uh, Harbourvest brings significant skill and expertise to each of those strategies. So that really uh, enables us to, to select, we believe, you know, the, on average, better performing investments. And that is evidenced by our track record. So the diversification benefit really is, is in terms of lower volatility uh, over time. We also have, uh, if anybody's interested, we, we could provide this, uh, this detail, but particularly in venture investing, the, the spread of returns, the statistical spread of returns from obviously in, in the case of venture, very low or zero uh, for, some, for some companies and some, uh, some funds, all the way up to several multiples of cost uh, means that actually diversification serves generally to increase returns because to capture the full value from venture investing, you tend to need to include those outliers at the positive end, which are, of course, relatively unusual and infrequent. So having a multi-manager, multi-fund portfolio in venture can actually enhance returns over a more concentrated approach. Thanks, Richard. Um, uh uh, an attendee called T-Man um, asked originally for three reasons why to, why to invest in Harbourvest versus other funds. Now, I felt Charlotte covered that with her um, five reasons for Harbourvest, but um, the questioner still feels that he, he's not, not entirely clear on, on why, why Harbourvest is better than other uh, private equity funds on the market. Uh, he mentions um, NBPE. Uh, I think, uh, Amanda, if you can bring back uh, Charlotte's slide, I think NBP was on that slide, is that correct, Charlotte? Yeah, correct. Uh, and I think you'll see that, um, if we go back a bit, Amanda, please. It's a few slides back. Seven or eight, I think. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Next one. One more, please. The other way. No, sorry, the, the, the other way. For, forward, Amanda, sorry. That's the one. No, one, one. Oh, yes, sorry. So, yes, here, here you've got, oh, NBPE isn't mentioned explicitly on that one. But um, certainly the performance there is stronger than the other funds that, that are mentioned. Um, so, Richard, Charlotte, would you like to comment further on, on why Harbourvest compared to other funds. Thank uh, you, Amanda. Happy to, Mark. I think I'll start. And um, I would say that NBP follows a slightly different strategy because they have a more direct portfolio. So they're providing a, a more concentrated uh, set of individual company exposures on both the equity and the credit side, which is a, a key difference from HVPE. We provide very little exposure to any forms of credit. So we're, we're really purely equity. Um, I would say that HVPE is really the, for want of a better phrase, it's the one-stop shop for private markets. If, if you want a single buy and hold investment that captures global opportunities through the full range of available styles in private market investing, then this, this is the fund, really. It's, it's almost a core holding. And some, um, some of our shareholders actually do hold other listed PE vehicles on the more concentrated side as a complement to HVPE. So they see us as you know, very much the stable bedrock of their portfolio, 
with with those others that that may outperform, but uh, you know potentially with more volatility. Uh, and I think the the performance of HVP often surprises many investors, given that we are the most diversified fund. We still manage to outperform other fund of funds vehicles with less diversification. Thanks. Uh, next question is uh, rather an interesting one. Uh, you have a large exposure to the very frothy tech sector. Uh, an example is snow, Snowflake. Uh, many would argue that the market valuation has run way too far ahead of intrinsic value based on fundamental economics. So how do you decide when to exit? Do you exploit market inefficiencies to lock in profits, even if that does not conform to your usual time horizons? If not, how do you hedge against the risk of a market correction? Okay, very, very interesting question. And um, there's quite a lot to unpack there. So I'll, yes. I'll try to be brief though. Um, so we do, of course, you know, we, we're absolutely highlighting these exposures uh, to some of the recent IPOs. Uh, we tend, like all IPO investors, tend to be locked up uh, and to be for, for at least six months. Uh, so we are able to sell generally some of our holding at the IPO, but there will be a lock-in period as well. Uh, so I'll in most cases, the decision on when precisely to sell the shares is made by an underlying manager that we have backed. So it's not necessarily a direct harbor vest decision, but generally they will try to maximize uh, the value achieved. And, uh, you know, of course, within, within their capabilities. Um, there is, however, a time horizon for private equity managers and they tend not to like to hold public equity for too long. So that the, the uh, strategy in general, uh, and of course it will vary, in general is to exit within a reasonable time frame of a year or two years, but it can be extended depending on, on the situation. Uh, there's absolutely risk in, in, you know, that's the flip side to this. There's risk in valuations, of course, and we've seen some share prices come down in, in, in the year to date. Uh, but I would stress that although it's a significant exposure, we are, are balanced with, as Charlotte highlighted, the, the buyout side of the portfolio, which has, has more mature privately held businesses that are less frothy, le perhaps less exciting, which is why we, we tend to feature the venture companies in, in these sort of introductory presentations. But they do form a solid base of, of strong growth. And we often see, well, if we look back uh, through Harbourvest's history, we see that the venture and growth portfolio on one hand and the buyout portfolio on the other behave in a similar way to the kind of growth-oriented public investments and the value investments, respectively. So in the last 10 years, venture and growth have outperformed buyouts, but that may well flip as uh, the long heralded move towards value investing may, may finally arrive. So I would say that HVPE is well hedged naturally in terms of the multiple strategies that we're, that we're following to try to deliver those consistent returns. Uh, I'd also mention there that if, if you are worried about the, the tech sector having run away too far, you could hedge yourself by, by shorting the NASDAQ, for example. Now, that's a pretty risky thing to do. And obviously, you'd have to know exactly what you're doing and make sure you size the position right. But um, rather than expecting the, the, the funds underlying HVPE to, to short, it's something you can do yourself if you're worried about that. Okay, uh, next question is another, another interesting one. Um, how do you uh, can apply ESG considerations in your investment policy? Uh, I might uh, throw that over to you, Charlotte, if you're, if you're okay with that. Yeah, sure. So, um, in the, for the most part, we, um, the manager um, takes ESG responsibilities um, into consideration when it comes to investing into the, um, the, the companies. And Harbourvest is um, fairly market leading in, in, this, in this way. Um, we have something whereby we use a scorecard to compare our manager's approach to ESG. And what happens there is that we, we rate the managers with a score in terms of how they invest with, with ESG factors and, um, and share those with the managers. Now, we don't all, always not to say we wouldn't invest with a manager with a poor score, but Harvest works with those managers to improve their ESG score. Harvest has also received a top rating from the UNPRI principles with an A plus rating. And um, in terms of the firm, um, it, it, it's very um, responsible in terms of um, climate change, 
uh, climate change strategy. It's signed up to the TC TCFD and, um, and is, is, is very focused on ESG. One thing that HVP has done um, is to create its own ESG policy. So not only are we looking at ESG on a look through through the manager, but also um, taking this more um, taking more responsibility from uh, on, on the HVP side. Thanks very much, Charlotte and uh, Richard. Okay, uh, next question from Alistair. Do you think the lack of a dividend reduces demand for the shares and therefore contributes to the discount? Contrast with APAX, for example. Uh, happy to answer that one. That, that's something we've wrestled with over the years, certainly. And um, it, it's, it's a, a, I suppose, a topic that regularly comes up, you know, whether that would make sense for us. Uh, like other private equity funds, you know, we, we do not generate any material income. Portfolio, and so um, there are many investors who, who don't necessarily appreciate um, an investment company turning capital into income. I appreciate that many do, and it's become, it's become more of a trend recently. Um, but we have, a, we have a difficult decision around this when we debate it because uh, some of our shareholders like the tax efficiency of a pure capital growth vehicle uh, versus effectively being forced to pay a, a marginal rate on, on a dividend. Um, we also looked at, um, in our most recent analysis, the, the sector as a whole in listed PE and tried to identify any correlation between dividends and discounts, any kind of sustained correlation. Uh, and uh, we, we found none, effectively. There are, there are individual examples uh, such as Apex, but Apex did also trade at a discount for, for a long time while it was paying a dividend. So there are, there are individual cases that appear, at least for a time, to... to um, you know, demonstrate that this is effective, but but over the long term, it's it seems to to uh, seems to revert to the mean effectively, and so the, the sector is you know, on this kind of frustrating twenty percent discount right now. It has been narrower uh, pre COVID, uh, and really, I think the sector and we ourselves need to do a better job of of communicating the value on offer here and and the the performance we've delivered, uh, as well as the investment proposition itself, because we we do see new listed funds. Uh, and I won't name them, but new listed funds offering exposure to unlisted companies trading at uh, premiums to NAV without necessarily uh, paying a dividend. So that it seems to be more sentiment driven than any kind of uh, you know, hard nosed analysis of the, of the figures. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so the, the next question concerns uh, costs and charges. Uh, Paul asks, I'm struggling to get a feel for what the annual management charge for this investment trust is. Do you know or, or where can I find out what the consolidated cost figure is? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we effectively have a total expense ratio of 2.5%, uh, which is made up of three main components. It's effectively the, the operating costs for HVPE as a listed company, which include the cost of our credit facility, which we need to uh, act as a, a backstop to our commitments. It includes the fees paid on the Harbourvest funds and also carried interest on some of those funds uh, around half of the NAV. Uh, to be clear though, 2.5% is not fully inclusive of all the underlying costs uh, charged by the underlying managers in the fund of funds programmes. We are looking to put together an estimate of that figure. It's a, uh, for various reasons I won't, I won't go into, it's very difficult to arrive at a, a reliable number for that. Uh, the reporting standards you know for for private equity managers are not quite uh, the same as they are in the public markets so we uh, we're working hard on that to provide an estimate but uh, but two and a half percent is the kid figure effectively that you'll see in the key information document which is on our website and happy to provide a link uh, so you can examine that as well thanks richard uh the next question uh, is really one for for me to answer uh, Humphrey states that uh, the presentation is very promotional. How can you possibly say you're not giving investment advice, which is an issue for, for ShareSock? Uh, well, all I would say on that is that all presentations by all companies are clearly aimed at promoting the company. You, you wouldn't expect anything else. And you certainly shouldn't buy or sell just based on what you hear in a presentation. So do research it, check whether what you've heard in the presentation makes sense, adds up, uh, check the reports and the track record and make your own mind up. 
that there's no point companies giving presentations if they're not going to promote themselves. And then currently, the final question from the audience here, uh, a bit of a strange one, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. Do you think the SEC will succeed in having Ripple declared a security? I saw that question. I have no idea, I'm afraid. <laughs> not, not, not particularly relevant to, to Harborvest, as far as I can see. Okay. I think it might be one of our logos on, on the slide, but uh, so I understand, understand ah, why it might have been okay. asked, but, but no, sorry, I don't have insight into that particular deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, then there were, if, if anyone else has any questions, do click the Q&A button and type them in. There, there are a couple that, that, that I would like to ask, though. I noticed from your slide something I hadn't observed before, which is that you have an office in Dublin. Um, can you tell me a little more about uh, what the well, what the particular reason for that is? Uh, there may be more to Dublin than I appreciate. Um, I, I, the main reason, as you might expect, was around the um, you know, the Brexit situation. So, um, wow. you know, preserving access to, to the European Union uh, for, for marketing and so on, um, and, and also you know we have an investment manager base there now. So it's it's really you know primarily for that reason, but also of course you know broadens out the, the geographic uh, spread of the offices. And, and we have seen, um, you know, as Charlotte mentioned, a new opening in, in Singapore as well. So we are generally growing, you know, the, the office footprint. <clears throat> yeah. And then, then uh, talking about, about Asia, um, I was just interested in your views about private equity in India, um, whether there's scope for, for more private equity investment in that country. I seem to recollect from, from your main presentation that I, I, I don't think private equity was very widely used in India. Was that correct so far? It's, I mean, certainly it's, it's been growing rapidly in recent years. So uh, we have circa three to 4% of assets in India. So it's kind of uh, China's the lead Asia country, but, but it's, it's significant and growing. Uh, it has a thriving uh, tech industry. Uh, some of the unicorns now are coming out of India as well. Um, so, so I think I think it's certainly a promising a promising destination for for private capital. And and um, you know we are uh, committed to increasing our Asia exposure. Actually, we're slightly below our target level. Uh, so, so you may see more in, into that uh, country as well. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for that. As we don't have any further questions, uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Thanks, Charlotte. And I think we'll we'll wrap it up at that point. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, Thank you. Nice to see you again. Good morning.